Now I'm going to talk about four specific types of market failure. Now market failures are interesting because sometimes people assume that markets never fail, that there's no alternative, there's no way to improve upon the market outcome. But a lot of people will agree that there are cases in which market forces aren't allowed to work perfectly. And so different books talk about different ways. I tend to focus on four, and in a microeconomics class I'll go into them in much more detail. In a macro class I think it's important to talk about the idea that government inter intervention might be necessary in some cases, particularly if you're talking about stimulating the economy or using monetary policy. So it's important to understand that in most cases there are some types of market failures, some room for the government. And so I usually talk about these four. So the first one is lack of competition or monopoly. Now sometimes you have these natural monopolies, things like roads or railroads where there's not really a lot of businesses starting up large projects. And so you wind up with one large business that functions as a monopoly, one, one provider. And so the government tends to regulate those. I think a lot of times about like cell phone networks, wireless networks, because there's a lot of cost going into building these huge towers that you actually wouldn't want a million companies making them, and it's expensive to do so. So there tends to be fewer and fewer cell phone providers, and then they have more power to raise the price, so the government regulates that. And actually, if cell phone companies want to merge, then the government will approve it, and, and maybe not approve it, because they, they watch this industry very closely. Secondly is asymmetric information, that's basically buyers and sellers, and that means that the two sides of the transaction do not have the same amount of information, and so you can go into more detail, and this particularly um, matters with the banking sector, because people who take out loans know if they'll be able to pay back, they know their income, they know their financial situation. If they can't get the other side to agree, in this case the bank doesn't know how likely they are to get their money back, the bank might not make any loans at all. And so that's the macroeconomic implication. Why do banks ask for so much information if you put out, take out a loan? Because they want to get repaid, and the only way to do it, to, to trust you, is to know your situation. And without that, there would be no loans. Now, traditionally, this was started with the idea of, of used cars. People who sell cars know if it's in good quality or not. Uh, people who buy cars need to find out. Now, one side or the other will actually trade information or buy information. You can buy services like Carfax to show the quality and all the, the records. You can actually have your all your oil changes and all your repairs over years. But you would be showing the buyer that the car indeed is good. Um, the buyer could take the car to a mechanic or do something to find out if the car is really good and make sure that they know the true quality of the car. Because if you don't know if the car is good or not, you wouldn't buy it at all. There would be no used car market, just like there would be no loan market if banks did not know who was going to repay or not. So it's some idea of, of knowing the quality of the item being bought or sold. And if, if, you, if you don't know the quality, you might actually assume it's bad and it would not buy it or sell it. Thirdly is public goods. Now public goods are, there's terms for this as non-rival and non-excludable. Public goods are basically goods that cannot be uh, kept from others which means that for non-payment, and that means it's not excludable. If people don't pay for the good, they're still allowed to use it. Non-rival means that the consumption of the good does not take it away from someone else. All right, so, so a classic example is military protection for a country. There's no way for one person to uh, not pay their military bill and then be subject to be the only person invaded if the country were invaded. Um, everybody or nobody, it's either one or the other, and so there's no way to bill people because there's no way to punish them for not paying. Likewise, one person being protected does not take away protection from the other. In fact, if, if everybody's protected, everybody's protected. Um, if one person is not going to be invaded in America, the other person, the other 300 million people won't be either, so it's actually jointly consumed. So there's something sometimes called the free rider problem. The free rider problem basically means that if I know I'll be protected either way, then I won't pay my bill. There's no way to get me to pay because I know that I can't be kept from this service. And so, therefore, the government tends to provide these goods. And that's really important because when, public, when something is a public good, there's a hard time making a market for it. And so here, the, the market can't really work, so the government does it. Um, one industry you might see this in is, is music, where music used to be LPs, compact discs, or whatever, where y if I bought a disc, it was not consumed by anyone else. And there, in, in the past, there were no ways to even copy music. Not excludable means that if I didn't buy it, I couldn't listen to it. And so it used to be that music was on a physical product that was rival and excludable. 
But now people can copy, people can download. In fact, if I listen to music, I can copy it for someone else and have two copies. So rival, it's non-rival. It doesn't take my copy away if I give it to you. Also, it's very hard to get people to pay for it because of the fact that marginal cost is so low. So music has actually gone from being rival and excludable to non-rival and non-excludable. Now, the government doesn't provide music, but it's very hard for the music industry to make money. And so the market for them is failing. They're looking for new ways to get their revenue. Now the externality is the fourth one I want to do, and this one I'm actually going to graph. An externality is when the cost or benefit falls on someone else. So the cost or benefit falls on what's called a third party. Now a third party is someone outside or external. All right, so there's two types of this. Now uh, negative externality is when the cost for society is higher than the cost on the individual. And here, positive is where the benefit for society is higher than the benefit of the individual. In this case, there's an extra benefit, and here's an extra cost. So the classic example is a smoking or pollution. If a smoker smokes, then they're thinking of a cost-benefit decision that might involve the cost of cigarettes, including taxes and health and everything. But they're saying, well, I'll make my own decision. I will smoke. Whatever happens to me, I pay money, I get sick, whatever. But society is all the people standing around who breathe the smoke. And so you will add an extra cost to the people called a negative externality, seeing that the bothersome smoke raises the cost higher than the costs that just fall on the individual. All right. So that's, that means that the society might want the person to stop smoking or make them smoke less than their own cost-benefit decision would dictate. So if you have an individual, your qu optimal quantity of this activity is drawn right here. All right, but what would society say? They would say, if you factor in our costs too, medical bills or just plain inconvenience, then you can actually say that the individual costs are lower and the cost to society is bigger. And so this is the cost that includes everybody else. And what that does is it raises the cost curve to have a higher crossing point, in this case, society's optimal quantity is less. Society would want these people to smoke less or polluters to pollute less. If you have a noisy neighbor, they're looking at their own benefit from music and their own cost of producing it, but society says, well, if you factor in our being annoyed, our costs are higher. So people can try and step in and you know, organize things to make them this not happen. There could be a market. You could pay people not to smoke. You could pay your neighbor to not be so loud. But usually you have noise ordinances or smoking bans or pollution bans. The only alternative might be to have a tax, and that's why cigarette taxes are so high, that, that you could actually raise the price of a pack of cigarettes to reflect the health costs and say, you know what, you are going to pay as much as it really costs. They have high taxes on cigarettes. It gets people to smoke less because this quantity is lower, but the money from taxes might go to smoking cessation programs to help people quit, or you might have people, you know, getting, you know, donating the money to like a health program or cancer treatment or something. But either way, the high cost because of the tax actually eliminates the extra smoking and takes into account the true cost of smoking. All right, so that's the negative externality. It raises costs. Society wishes less of a bad activity, but how do they get it to stop? Taxation, bans, other government activity where the market fails. Now, what about marginal benefit? Now, that would be a positive externality where the marginal benefit to society is greater than the marginal benefit to the individual. And so what this means is someone doing a good activity takes their costs and benefits into consideration, but the people around them like it more. Classic example would be like a gardener in the neighborhood of a beautiful flower bed, pays for the flowers, does the work, decides I'm only going to grow this many flowers. But the neighbors love it and they say, why don't you grow more? Well, they're not paying for it. Now, they could take up a collection and say, here, here's some money. Why don't you increase your benefit? Why don't you change your cost-benefit decision? And so they might actually try to get more flowers grown more than the individual gardener wants. Right? The government usually does not mandate flower growing. But somehow, if you gave something good as a benefit to this gardener, they would decide to have more flowers grown. And so that's, you could match the benefit to the individual to make it higher to match society's benefit. Now, that's a classic example. Now, another example you might see is in public education. 
because people who don't go to school themselves benefit from having educated neighbors and coworkers. And so people in college pay tuition, they look at the cost and benefit, how should I go two years, four years, not at all. They're looking at a cost benefit decision. But because educated people are so valuable, governments often pay money and say, we're going to help you. We're going to raise the benefit to education. And so one thing you might see is a state university, which is funded partially through tax dollars. That's called a subsidy. A subsidy is the opposite of a tax. Giving money for good activities as opposed to taxing bad activities. If you put the money into the pockets of the college students through a tuition program uh, paid through the state, funding the state, or maybe subsidized loans where the interest is paid or it's easier to get loans for college, or grants, you would actually see that college students would see a higher benefit. Their cost-benefit decision will put them here, which means the quantity of a good activity goes up. So society wants more good activities, they can subsidize them to increase the, those. And if society does not like bad activities, they can tax them. All right, so, so you might say, well, that's still government intervention. Usually subsidies and taxes are preferred to outright quantity restrictions. No one's going to force you to go to college. No one's going to force you to grow uh, flowers. But the subsidy helps you make your own decision. Likewise, a tax might be preferable to an outright smoking ban. But either way, the market doesn't allocate resources efficiently if people want more or less of something. That's when the government steps in. So these are just four market failures, but they show how sometimes the cost-benefit decision, the supply-demand decision, doesn't really take everything into account. That leaves room for the government to regulate industries, help regulate industries like used cars or banking, provide certain goods, or encourage or discourage good or bad behavior.